there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. It's time for another Ask a Crafter, and I am pulling these questions from um, one of the most recent threads on the community tab on my YouTube channel. So that's where you want to leave your questions if you want to ask one for a future video. Make sure you look at the most recent Ask a Crafter thread and make sure it doesn't say comments closed on the top and then put your question there. I'm recording this on March 18th, 2021. So um, if you have left a question since then, then it may be in an upcoming video. As long as you don't put it in a thread that says comments closed on the top, then you'll be good. And I'm answering questions that have over 10 thumbs ups on it. So make sure you vote for the questions you like most over on the community tab so that they will get answered. This first question comes from Melissa Fancelli Cox. She asks, do you have any uh, tutorials or tips for beginner watercolor painters? And yes, I actually have a beginner watercolor playlist and I recommend starting on the birch tree project because it's a really great way to learn a bunch of techniques and get familiar with the paints. Because honestly, you can watch all the techniques in the world, all the tutorials in the world, but nothing is going to help you improve until you start painting. And uh, the more you paint, the better you're gonna get. All right. Uh, Melody Maid asks, I have questions about building my crafty YouTube channel. Is that an approachable, is that an appropriate subject? Yes, absolutely, Melody. And I just recently saw a bunch of questions added on one of the recent Ask a Crafter videos um, in the comments on the video about uh, starting a YouTube channel. So I think that would be a really great appropriate question. Um, so, uh, Honestly, my recommendation, if you're thinking about starting a YouTube channel, I would say use what you have. Uh, you don't want to spend a ton of money. Generally, your phone will have a better camera than what you can purchase for a reasonable amount. You might as well try and see if you like it without buying anything new because once you start getting into buying uh, a better camera than what your phone is, you're probably looking at like 700 bucks or more and um, lighting and all of that jazz. I would recommend, and I can actually spin this around to show you, I recommend getting the um, lights at the hardware store, those aluminum clip lights and daylight balance bulbs. So I use the daylight CFLs or day, daylight LED bulbs. So that way your lighting will be um, color corrected. And really you don't need much more than that. Uh, you may need some software to edit or you could just record it all in one take or maybe practice a few times first. Um, and there you go. It's, it's not a very complex, it can be complex, but it shouldn't be complex when you're first getting started just just have fun, record some videos. You're probably gonna suck at first, we all do. We all have those first 100 videos or so, they're total trash, um, but then you get better. Or you're, you realize that you don't really enjoy it and you move on. So it's better to realize that before you spend thousands of dollars on equipment. Um, the lighting is more important than your camera, so make sure you've got plenty of light, but it doesn't have to be expensive. And um, just try to, you know, keep your project in frame. I have a, um, a camera mount hooked to my ceiling to record my desk. It was my husband made it. Actually, I can show you that too. Um, I just got a piece of foam core like clipped to it. I do that for sound baffling a little bit, but it's just a, it'll fold up out of the way. It's just a piece of wood with a thumb screw on the bottom that fits the camera, uh, the little mount on the bottom of the camera so I can um, hook this camera onto it when I'm filming tutorials. And uh, it is nice if you are gonna buy a camera though, you get something that's got um, a flip around screen so you can see what you're doing. <laughs> I know some people have setups where they can see what they're doing on their iPad or whatnot, but um, but I don't, I just use the, the screen on my camera. So, and a, a camcorder is easier to use than a DSLR. I switched from a camcorder to DSLR because of the quality, the picture quality was better, but I miss the camcorder because it was just a lot easier to use, so. Um, yeah, just use what you have and, and have fun. And uh, if you love it, great. And if you don't, then, you know, you haven't spent anything. And, um, you know, you can learn pretty quickly whether it's something you want to do or not. And I do have a video on how I film my videos. If you want to check that out, on, I'll try to remember to link that down below. But if not, just search, uh, go to my channel and click the little magnifying glass and type um, how I film YouTube videos and it will should come right up. Um, let's see, Evie Kazi is asking, as a beginner, I'd love to see what the absolute essential items for card making are in your opinion. Um, she's overwhelmed and I don't blame you. There's so many things out there for card making now. And sometimes I get overwhelmed. Like I'll pull my products to make a card and then I've chose so many things and I'm like, this is overwhelming, I have too many options. So I actually have a series of videos called Stamp School and the first video goes over supplies. So I highly would recommend that. I also have another video that's just like the top um, five or 10 supplies for card making. So both of those, I'll try to remember to link them, but I'll probably forget guys because 
<sighs> I'm a dingling sometimes, but uh, so stamp school or um, my 10 supplies for card making. But basically you want a waterproof black ink pad. Um, I would say like watercolor pencils, um, good cardstock, good quality cardstock. Uh, it depends on really what you also like to do for a coloring media. If you like to use alcohol markers, then I would get a alcohol safe ink pad and some alcohol compatible cardstock. If you prefer to use watercolor markers or watercolor pencils, I would prefer, I would say, a smooth watercolor paper and a waterproof ink pad. There are hybrid ink pads that work pretty good for both. Um, personally, I use archival for my watercoloring and I use uh, memento for my alcohol inks but there are there are pads out there that will do it all just I don't think they do them as well as a standalone pad but that's just me um, but I do have videos that go really in depth on that and I would recommend checking out those because that's that's visual I have all the supplies out there um, for you to see so I'll try to link that down below but just search stamp school if I don't um, let's see Andrew and Saldi the third asks, I have those cool leaf stencils and was wondering if you have ideas or a tutorial, I don't see one in the search, on where you create a watercolor painting with stencils. Um, let's see, what have I, have I done a watercolor painting with stencils? I have used stencils like to embellish over a watercolor painting that's kind of bland. So um, I know I did one with grapes once and I had painted the grapes. I'm like, oh, it's really ho-hum. I felt it just was blah. So I'm like, well, I've got nothing to lose. I'm going to, you know, doctor it up a little bit. And so I took some, I think I took some polka dot stencils and some gelatos, which are like these water-based crayons. And I just kind of colored over the stencil and blended them with my finger and added some texture on top of my watercolor painting that way. Uh, you can also sponge watercolor paint. Like just try not to have the sponge too wet. You can sponge through a stencil. Uh, I would do that for like maybe texture or adding some pattern here and there. Um, but I generally do it at the end of my painting because watercolor is transparent. So if you do the stenciling first, then you might, um, then you might end up putting stenciled imagery somewhere you end up wearing, wanting to paint and then you can't cover it up. Uh, I have a class over on Craftsy. If you're a member at Craftsy, if you look up Mix It Up, Mixed Media, Step by Step, I have some mixed media. There's three mixed media paintings in that class and I do use stencils as well. So that might be helpful. Um, if you're already a member, I probably wouldn't buy the membership just for that one class. You can purchase a class individually. I'll try to remember to link that up too. Um, there's a link to it from my blog if you want to check that out. But um, since that was mixed media, you could actually use a stenciling first because I went over that with pastels and stuff. But I would generally use it to add interest towards the end. I use stamps the same way with my watercolor if I need to add some interest towards the end. All right, uh, Molly Faircloth asks, I am interested in expanding my alcohol marker skills. I've watched all the reviews since you always have a project as part of the review. So maybe some intermediate skill projects or drills with alcohol markers. Um, well, Molly, it's great you asked that because probably by the time this video comes out, I will have my ways to use a colorless blender video or do's and don'ts for a colorless blender. So that's really gonna help you build your skills because there's a lot of different techniques you can do with that. Um, I would also recommend just like take a page in your sketchbook and practice blending colors together. Pick colors that do not seem to be related at all and see if you can find a few intermediary color intermediary colors to blend them together. Um, I'll try to incorporate some more alcohol coloring footage when I do use markers in my um, my videos. It's just such a such a long process and I feel like people tune out during that. But if I know people are interested in it, well, let me know in the comments below. If you guys like to see would like to see some more alcohol marker tutorials, let me know in the comments below and I can make it happen because I'm the boss. I'm the boss of this this ship. I can make it happen. So let me know if you guys are interested. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for questions. I have more than 10 thumbs ups. Okay, Renee Casse. Sorry, <laughs> pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure. Um, she says, I'm mostly a watercolor artist, but would like to expand to colored pencils, primarily botanical art. What are some effective ways to make the transition? Is it beneficial to use colored pencils in adult coloring books as a way to learn how they handle? Well, um, yeah, you definitely could do that. A lot of times the paper in the coloring books are not, they're okay, but they're generally smoother than what you'd use in an art paper. So I would photocopy them onto a drawing paper and then I would, uh, I would work on that. That certainly would be a good way to get started. There's some really gorgeous ones by Dover and there's, um, I don't know if I have it in here or not. Yes, this, this book right here, um, The Art of Nature 
I'll try to remember to link it up below. I'll probably forget. I'll, you know, I'll leave it out. So maybe I'll remember. But this is some really gorgeous botanical images in it. But the paper's kind of slick and I find that I can't get the amount of layers I need for the depth of color I want. And plus, if you photocopy it, then you can try it a few times. Um, you know, get the hang of it. Uh, so yeah, or you can even experiment by doing your initial wash with your watercolor and then doing color pencil over it. In fact, I like that because you get that base of color down so you don't get that grainy look and then you get the best of both worlds. So that would be my personal take on that. That's the way I like to approach it. But, um, but either way, yeah, definitely. Okay, Jody's Panache asks, ask a crafter question. Can you refresh slash refill a Versamark pen? If so, how? Yes, you can. Um, what you wanna do is take a little cup, like, um, like a shot glass, and do half and half mixture of glycerin, like vegetable glycerin and distilled water, and then um, mix it up really well. And then what you wanna do, I don't have, do I have one? Oh, I don't think I have one handy, but say this is a Versamark pen, it's got a brush tip. You set the pen down in the shot glass, just let it sit, I'd let it sit overnight, let it wick up that moisture. If it's a double-ended pen, like the Stampin' Up ones are double-ended, um, then do the other side and just let it wick it wick it up and that will work great. I really love to use those types of pens not only for embossing but they're really great if you have like a palette of chalk um, pastels. You can pick up the chalks and color so like seamlessly on stamped images and I also really like it with watercolor pencils on stamped images because just on plain cardstock you can do just a little bit of watercolor pencil around the edge, take that Versa mark, uh, marker and just like blend out that and it looks like the most exquisite Copic coloring. It's really nice and so easy and so limited supply. So yeah, definitely. You can keep reusing that until you frayed the nib and it's and it's like, you know, not giving you the results you want anymore. And I've actually, I have clogged a nib before with like the chalk pastels and I have rinsed it off under water, really cleaned them good and then done the glycerin to the glycerin and the shot glass deal and wicked it back up into the, the thing and it works great. It's great if you're a teacher because a lot of times you'll have a bunch of those pens uh, for like a class and you know, they can be expensive to replace, not to mention throwing away all the plastic. If the tips are still good, yeah, reduce them and that works great for me. If you have a bunch of pens to do, you can take like a mason jar and uh, you know, put a whole bunch of them in there at once. Just, you don't need much. Just put like maybe like a quarter inch of solution in there. You could even save it if you wanted to like keep it in a little jar. As long as it's distilled water or boiled water or something wouldn't have any, you know, nasties in it. It should be good. Okay, the next question with over 10 thumbs ups is from Beth C. She says, I have the Waffle Flower Color Swatch set. How do you stamp out just 12 for a swatch card to put in my palette? I make a mess when I try stamping less than the entire stamp. I'm just learning to stamp. Well, honestly, what I do, Beth, is I stamp out a whole sheet at a time. I keep stamping and stamping and stamping while I have it out, and then I cut apart the amount that I need, and then I keep the rest just in a handy, um, like bin next to my table so when I need to swatch something else out I can just grab one. Watercolor paper is pretty good for that because I know I can swatch my colored pencils out on it and I can swatch my watercolors out on it so that's what I do. Um, for alcohol markers I usually have to swatch a whole and stamp it all over again but I use it on um, a smooth cardstock with uh, alcohol marker friendly ink um, and generally with markers I'm swatching out a whole set so I use them up but yeah swatch them all out cut them apart and just use what you need that's that's my advice don't worry about just uh just stamping out a few okay we have time to do uh, another question or two let's see uh, Beth C asks, what's the best ink to stamp with on fabric? Uh, well, I actually have one, and I don't know if it's the best, but uh, honestly, you know what? I like, um, I'll show you what I used last. I really liked this Altenew Obsidian Pigment Ink. This worked really well. I did, um, so a face mask and I stamped some big flowers and I colored them with ink tents and I did, before I used the ink tents on it, I did iron it just to make sure it was heat set and then I used the ink tents and I washed it and they've, I washed it probably like, oh, I don't know. I made that mask this summer and I use it probably more than others. I mean, it's been washed dozens of times and this ink is still holding up. So, and this is just great for a lot of different things like sentiments and whatnot. So I would recommend the Altenew Obsidian Pigment Ink. There's probably other pigment inks that'll work just as well, but because I personally use this one, I can definitely recommend it. I also have, and but you know what? I don't really know if I want to recommend it because I bought these on clearance, the Memento uh, Fabric Inks. I haven't used them, so I don't know uh, if you want colors. I would just go for a safer fabric ink. It'd probably be, 
an oil-based pigment ink, I would think, and then you would heat set it with like an iron. Um, but that Altenu one worked really well. They only have that in black, I think. They also have like a gold, but I don't know if that one would be safe on fabric. Um, I don't think they have pigment, oh, geez, I don't know. I don't think they have other pigment inks. I think those are it. The other ones are all dye inks or hybrid inks, I do believe, but worked for me. And uh, I love ink tents on the fabric. That works really well too. Okay, let's see. Oh, we're only at 15 minutes. Wow, time is, uh, time is, well, I would say it's flying by. I'm having a good time. Um, okay, this one is from Antonia Pan. And she says, what should I be aware of when doing mixed media? Uh, for example, layering acrylic over oil, other supply, pairing condition concerns. Can I use oil or acrylic on mixed media watercolor paper? All right, the thing with like, if you're talking about oil paint, that is probably gonna dry slower than anything else you would possibly use for mixed media, so that would go last. You only wanna use oil paint if you've got a um, like a primer, like you're on canvas or paper that's been primed with either acrylic gesso or has a really good coating of acrylic paint down below. Otherwise, that oil can seep into your surface and rot it, like basically eat the fibers of the paper or the cotton canvas um, or linen canvas, whatever you're using. But generally, when you're doing mixed media, you wanna make sure that whatever you put on top is gonna to stick to what's on bottom. So you want your quicker drying layers uh, to be on bottom. So for instance, if you're doing mixed media and you're starting off with, um, with acrylic paint, you're gonna be limited to what you can put over the acrylic paint. If the acrylic paint is like toothy enough, then you could do colored pencil. You could do, um, uh, if it's really toothy, you could do pastel. You could do oil pastel. Um, but you wouldn't want to do watercolor because the watercolor is going to beat up on top of the acrylic. If you start off with watercolor, you can put almost anything on top except for oil because the oil would eat down through the paper. So you could do like colored pencils, you could do watercolor pencils. Generally your last layers are going to be the shiniest, um, slickest things such as colored pencil because not much is going to stick on, on top of colored pencil. Um, you do pastel because if you try to put something on top of pastel, you'd wipe it off, it would just brush it away. So you wanna kind of think in layers like that. Will it stick to the layer that's down below and will, it, will the thing I put on top brush it off, basically? You can use a product called Workable Fixative between layers of certain, um, uh, certain products to trap it down so that you can work on top of it. But I generally would say like colored pencils, pastels, those things would be my top layers and things like watercolor because that's not going to stick on top of many things. That should be your bottom layer. So kind of plan accordingly and experiment. Um, and if you notice that things are flaking off, like using gel pen over colored pencils, they call that's not considered archival because you could flake off that gel pen. You could scrape it off with your fingernail. So it could obviously be scraped off accidentally. Um, like you don't want to use alcohol markers over acrylic products because the alcohol will dissolve the acrylic and could ruin the marker tip. So just kind of uh, kind of experiment, but keep those things in mind. And let's see, we're almost at 20 minutes. Um, looking for more than 10 thumbs up. I'm so organized. Um, oh my gosh, I, maybe I've gotten through all of the ones that have more than 10 thumbs up. Okay, here's one, and I've seen this one listed two different places, so I'm gonna answer it. Uh, Scott Heveru Outdoors asks, I have two 45 well palettes that are deep, one for gouache, one for watercolor. Can you recommend a 48 color tube watercolor and gouache set that won't shrink and crack? I can use to refill my palettes. Personally, light fastness is not a concern. 90% of my paintings are in my sketchbook, um, so I can scan, sell, reprints. Um, most gouache is gonna is gonna shrink and is gonna come out of the palette. Um, I found it for as far as a uh, lower priced one, the Lucas Studio did pretty well in a palette. I had it in a pretty shallow palette. I didn't have a really thick layer, but that one did pretty well. Um, the M Graham gouache does pretty well. That's pricey though. I don't think you, you're not gonna find it in a set of 45. You'd have to buy individual tubes of that. Um, I, I've actually switched over to using the jelly gouache a lot because I really love the palettes they come in. So if you didn't already have a palette, I would suggest a jelly gouache, just buying a jelly gouache palette because it stays, the, the seal on it keeps the paint moist. You can let it dry out if you want to though, if that's more convenient for you. Um, my biggest uh, recommendation would be if you want to do that, if you want to dry out the gouache 
any gouache is probably going to be fine, but just plan on adding a bunch of glycerin to it or honey. I would I would recommend glycerin because honey can make it a little too sticky, but uh, you stir in, um, it could be up to 25% glycerin. That will make it a little more transparent though, so keep in mind, but stir that in and that's just going to help it retain some of the moisture in the air, from the air, so it doesn't just crack and fall out. That's why... It, that's why um, gouache cracks. It doesn't have as much glycerin. It doesn't have a humectant, and it's got a lot of chalk in it or chalky pigment particles in it that um, that don't grab onto the moisture in the air, and that's why they crack and fall out. So it probably doesn't matter if you're looking for a budget one. Um, I would just go with whatever. Probably like the Arteza one's pretty good. They're two gouache, and then I think they come in a sixty set. Very affordable. I think it's around forty bucks, maybe more. I'm not sure. Probably between forty and sixty bucks. Honestly, I don't know these days. <laughs> with the pandemic, prices have been all over the place. Um, but add glycerin and that will really help you. Even with like their, their watercolors, you need to add glycerin to it because their watercolors crack quite a bit. And uh, for watercolor, any any good brand of watercolor should squeeze out into a palette and not crack. Any professional brand should. Um, the uh, Any student brand, uh, any of the name brand student brands should be fine, like um, Grumbacher Academy or Cotman. Um, Van Gogh, those should all be fine, just as is. You could add a couple drops of glycerin if you were concerned. But the budget budget ones that come in like a set of, you know, 24 for like under 20 bucks, those would need some glycerin in them to keep them from cracking. And you probably won't find them to be a heck of a lot different from gouache, so uh, you probably don't need both. I probably would go higher end on the watercolor because there's not as much difference in appearance when you're using a student grade gouache to an artist grade gouache, but there's a big difference in, a, in appearance between a budget watercolor and a uh, professional watercolor. And you don't need 45 colors though uh, for a professional watercolor because you can mix and mix and mix. It's so transparent you don't get that dulling down from over mixing like you would with um, a budget paint. So um, that would be my recommendation. Maybe get like, you know, I don't know, 12 tubes of artist grade watercolor and get a big set of um, budget grade gouache and you should be good. Arteza, the Hemi gouaches that come in the jelly cups, I really like those. Uh, they've all been really, really good quality, uh, honestly. If and you said light fastness isn't an issue, I wouldn't, I would not uh, hesitate to go with one of those. They even have a 56 set that comes in the jelly cups. So sorry, you are, if you already bought the palettes, I mean, I don't know. It's uh, the, the Hemi gouaches, the jelly cup gouaches are such an affordable option that it's like you're getting the palette for free. Of course, you could store them in that big palette and just kind of scoop out a little bit for your travel palette if that's what you're looking at filling up. That would, that would definitely work. Um, so many options, so many palettes, so many palettes, so little time. I want to thank you for watching this episode of Ask a Crafter. If you have a question, go over to the community tab on my channel. You can click my name down below this video. It'll take you to my channel page. Uh, look at the top of the page. You're going to see uh, videos, um, playlists, community. Click on community and just leave your questions at the most recent Ask a Crafter call for questions and uh, maybe we'll hear yours answered in an upcoming video. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting. Bye!